Well, we'll move on to our next talk. So our next speaker is Paul Fremantle from Weaveworks. Paul is going to be talking about clusters as coppice, which sounds quite interesting. So Paul is joining us live, but we will do, uh, we will be playing his talk and then we'll be going back to ask him some questions. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Fremantle and I'm the VP of Technical Product Strategy at Weaveworks. And uh, welcome to my talk, which is on clusters as coppice. I hope you enjoy it. So I think we all know the analogy of pets versus cattle. Uh, the idea that we can treat, we used to treat our machines, our server setups as pets and we would SSH in and kind of feed and water them individually. And now we have immutable, repeatable systems. I'm not a huge fan of this analogy. Uh, so I spent a bit of time trying to come up with a better analogy. And why don't I like it? Well, firstly, I think a lot of farmers do treat their, their cattle really, really well. I mean, here's one that is obviously groomed and looked after and, and a prize winner. And also there's large parts of the world that uh, revere cattle or, or are vegan and so forth. And so I just don't think it's a very good analogy. I'd like to propose a different analogy around coppice. So coppice is kind of woodland where you just cut it right back to the ground and it regrows super fast. And it's usually uh, woods like hazel and willow that are used. Uh, and it's kind of a way of farming woodland in a much more dynamic way than traditionally forestry is. And so my analogy, and, and thanks to a guy called Tim Seabrook, who, who I discussed this with, is bonsai versus coppice. So bonsai are trees that are super uh, manicured, looked after, uh, individually crafted, and coppice is exactly the opposite. You just cut it down, it regrows. Um, so what's this got to do with Kubernetes clusters? So the fact is clusters are often still treated as pets. You know, the workloads, Kubernetes makes it really clear that we don't treat the workloads that way. The workloads are uh, managed through declarative pods. You can kill the pods, you can kill servers. But the fact is the overall cluster is often treated as a pet. And I've seen this both personally in working with people and, and helping them debug things and, and going in and fixing clusters, but also uh, there's a lot of evidence that, for example, at AWS, lots of EKS clusters are on very old versions of Kubernetes, which is a kind of a, and have not been restarted or killed, uh, are just out of date. So that's kind of a sign that we're not uh, doing immutable uh, recycling of clusters. So how are we going to do that? Well, I think that the right working model for treating things as coppice is GitOps. I'm not going to go into all the uh, key definitions, the five key attributes that the GitOps working groups come up with, but the fundamental fact that we can use GitOps, uh, the, the way I see it is a kind of a, a remote control for copist uh, workloads. And we certainly have seen this. So, so this is something called the GitOps maturity model. Uh, which is based on a lot of working with a lot of different people doing GitOps. And what we've seen is that as people expand their GitOps usage, they start out by really working on workloads at level one. They're, they're, they're GitOpsing their applications. But then as they get further, they start to GitOps the infrastructure and the clusters, as well as the config and the workloads. And then a few uh, people like telcos are scaling this out and managing thousands of clusters at the edge uh, using fleet management and using GitOps as the key way of doing it. So uh, I think this is a really key set of capabilities and this, this maturity model is a, a useful way of looking at it. Um, and, you know, to, to summarize, GitOps is kind of using versioned process-led remote, remote control. Process-led because we use pull requests and merges to really track and review changes 
to that infrastructure, which is really cool. So how do we do this? Well, there's a key technology called the Kubernetes Cluster API, also known as CAPI. And CAPI is a project which basically enables you to treat Kubernetes clusters like any other Kubernetes workload through the Kubernetes API, using YAML to define it, and using kubectl to deploy and declare it. So uh, basically what you have is you have a management cluster, you deploy CAPI into the management cluster, and then whenever you deploy API calls against that management cluster, that affects leaf clusters that are created and deployed and managed by CAPI. And this supports many, many infrastructures, including uh, Google, uh, Amazon, AWS, Microsoft Azure, as well as uh, vSphere, and, and several bare metal providers like Maz and Packet. So this is super cool technology that supports multiple ways and places to run your Kubernetes clusters. So it's declarative infrastructure. And because it uses the Kubernetes API, we can use traditional uh, GitOps tools built for Kubernetes to do the reconciliation. So this is really cool. We can use Argo CD, Flux, or I'm going to talk about a project called Read GitOps that builds on top of CNCF Flux. So I'm going to do a quick demo and talk you through this. And what I'm going to do in this quick demo is uh, deploy a uh, GitOps runtime, Weave GitOps, and CAPI into a uh, simple kind cluster running locally on my machine sync it up to a Git repository, add some YAML into that Git repository and see it reconcile and create a leaf cluster. So I've already got a kind cluster created and now I'm going to install uh, CAPI into this cluster using the tool cluster cuttle, which is part of the CAPI project. This is slightly sped up. It takes a little longer to install and get cert manager running, for example. But this is, this is you know, just for demo purposes, I've sped up this recording slightly. Now I'm going to install uh, Weave GitOps into this runtime. This is basically installing Flux. So if you know Flux, you'll see the customized controller, Helm controller, and so forth that you know. And now I'm going to go and uh, clone a repository I've created. Now this repository literally has nothing in it apart from a README file at this point in time. So this is a really simple repository, and I'm going to now get this repository to sync with my management cluster. So uh, using Wego App Add, that's now set up to sync. And I'm now going to pull up K9S, and we're going to look at what clusters there are. First, I'll show you what pods there are. You can see various Cappy and, and Wego pods running, and now I'm going to go back and monitor the clusters. Now I'm going to jump to the other uh, half of the shell, and I'm going to go to that uh, repository and create a new branch. And I'm going to check in a YAML into that branch. So this Docker cluster YAML basically defines a local cluster using Docker. I'm going to create my branch. And then I'm going to use a pull request uh, and a merge to get that into the cluster. So I commit my change to the, to the branch. Uh, I'm going to use the GitHub uh, CLI client to create a new PR, uh, submit that PR, and now I'm going to merge it. Now, of course, normally there'd be a review process, there'd be uh, different people looking at this, um, but for demo purposes, you get the idea. So as soon as it's merged, uh, you'll see uh, with GitOps reconciles that definition, and now it starts to create a cluster. And actually there, it's provisioned already. So that was really nice. We provisioned a cluster uh, just by basically checking in a YAML, doing a pull request and merging it. Um, and so if you want to find out more about Weave GitOps, it's in GitHub. It's an open source project. Uh, one of the other exciting aspects of Weave GitOps is that we're creating a, um, a user interface for it. And this is an early preview, this is uh, not quite released yet, uh, of, of, a, of the 
capping template capability. So I'm going to basically deploy a, a template and this template lets me tweak different aspects like the uh, control plane, which version of Kubernetes, how many replicas to have for the uh, worker nodes. Uh, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to create a PR for me. Uh, and this time I'm going to use the GitHub API, uh, sorry, the GitHub website to merge the PR. So create the pull request. You can see that that's going to um, pop up a the cl cluster definition there. It's still not created because we haven't merged the PR. Uh, you can see there's the YAML and just have a look, quick look at that. And then I'm going to go back to the pull request and uh, do the merge. And I can then delete the branch and go back to the cluster definition. And it's going to take a little time to reconcile. I have sped up this video as well slightly. Uh, just because this is a very short talk. Um, and uh, you can see there it's found the cluster. And uh, if I go and look at the status, you can see it's provisioned. It's still booting up, but I'm, and you can download the kube config. So very quick demos. Um, I hope they were useful. And um, quick summary. So, I hope you like the analogy of bonsai versus coppice. Uh, if you think that's useful, then obviously please feel free to use it. I think it's uh, perhaps more interesting and more challenging than pets versus cattle. Uh, the cluster API is a really key project. If you haven't looked at it already, uh, I recommend you do. It gives you declarative control of, of leaf clusters using Kubernetes APIs. Very, very interesting. Weave GitOps is an open source GitOps tool uh, that's basically a, a super nice wrapper on top of the CNCF Flux project. We're building a nice UI around it. Uh, this concept of putting GitOps and CAPI, I think, creates a, a really effective operating model for treating clusters as copies. And I think that'd be of interest. And finally, that GitOps maturity model, I just uh, talked about it very briefly. But uh, if you want more information, there's a white paper about that. And, and I think that's a really good way of tracking how, uh, how your organization is using GitOps and, and where to go next. And I will leave you up with some resources. And um, hopefully we have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Well, I'm here live if anyone does have any questions. Um, and um, please post them in the uh, Slack or in the YouTube, and I'll get to them. And Good I know morning, Paul. Some... Good morning, sorry. I got, the... <laughs> I got slightly chucked out of the stream there. but <laughs> So, um, yeah, that was great. Um, I love GitHub. It's super cool. And I think if you, you know, that's really the, uh, the ultimate expression of, of doing uh, cloud native right. Um, you know, in some ways, I, I uh, you know, I talk a lot in in uh, in my talks about how uh, fully automated pipelines are really the, you know, the, the biggest uh, indicator that that you are far along on your on your transformation journey, right? I mean, the technology is one thing, but you know, it's really this uh, these these automated pipelines that are the uh, the key indicator of how cloud native you are, at least in in my view. Um, I had an, uh, one question that I had actually about Cluster API, um, which I, I, again, Cluster API is a, a project I love. I know quite a few people who work on it. Um, it all becomes very inception like, you know, you start to think about it in your head, right? Because uh, you need an API server to start with, right? What's, what's the kind of current best practice on that sort of mini seed cluster that you use to, to, to kick things off? So uh, what I've seen done a lot is to use a kind cluster mm. and then use that to uh, create a, say, an EKS or AKS cluster and then pivot into that new cluster. So then that uh, cluster that you've created becomes self-managed. 
which is kind of really cool. I don't know if people know about this idea of pivoting. It's basically saying, well, I've started the cluster elsewhere, but now I'm going to take control of it locally and, and have it manage itself. Um, the the other option is just to have a, you know, is, is just to, I think it depends on what your, what your model is. If you are, say, doing multi-cloud, you might say, okay, I'm going to choose one provider, spin up my cluster there, and then use that to manage all the others. Um, if you're doing development, then certainly just having Kind as the management cluster or Minikube or uh, Docker desktop or some kind of local uh, cluster is perfectly acceptable as well. But the, the ones like the kind of more production one is to start in a development cluster like Kind, uh, start to spin up a, a real cluster and then pivot into that. Awesome. I, I did like your bonsai versus copy, so I think time will tell whether that analogy uh, that analogy sticks, Paul. But well, I think there's lots of ones, and and actually, if you look in the Slack, um, uh, Chris contacted me and pointed me at a LinkedIn post where he's also got a kind of vegan alternative to pets versus cattle. <laughs> so I think there's a few people here who who find that maybe that we do need a slightly better analogy. So. Um, yeah, I'm not saying it's the best, but it, it's certainly a, n nice to have that discussion. Awesome. I'm just just flicking through through Slack quickly to make sure that we've picked up um, any questions. We do have a couple of comments. Very nice copies. Makes most sense from Bruno. So uh, obviously somebody uh, that resonate that's starting to resonate. Um, Bruno is also asking. So you move the controlling to inside the cluster itself. I, but I think that must be a reference to the conversation that we've kind of just had, I think, about uh, how cluster API controls the building of other clusters, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, so, so cluster API requires a Kubernetes cluster as a management cluster that can then manage lots of other clusters. But there is this also kind of pivot model where that can become self-managed as well. So... So you can manage, that, but you do always need one extra cluster. And, and you know, uh, I guess we're probably going to see that also be offered as a service uh, because that's a clear thing. You know, there's an obvious, you know, hybrid model where, okay, I'm going to run my clusters in whichever cloud I want, but I don't want the bother of running that management cluster and I wouldn't mind if someone did it for me. So, so you know, I expect as, as CAPI develops, we'll see people offering you know, CAPI management cluster as a service is a kind of key control plane. And, and we've seen similar things. You know, we've seen other SaaS models where you can spin up clusters. I think the nice thing about using CAPI is that it's a standardized way with direct support from the actual providers. So, you know, Amazon contributes to the AWS provider, mm -hmm. Google contributes to the Google provider and so forth. I think it says something about the power of the Kubernetes API as well, that, uh, you know, the API model is is uh, started to spin out into so many other things, including, you know, spawning itself, you know, the, 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 those standardized APIs become a really important driver in uh, massive adoption of, of, uh, of open source in that way. And, and we've just seen cross-plane accepted into incubation in the yeah, CNCF, that's that well. and that's another great example of, of a project which is saying, you know, let's use the Kubernetes API as a standardized API for everything, including itself, but also then, you know, RDS databases, all sorts of other other infrastructure, and, and that, you know, that obviously takes this whole clusters as Coppice idea even further because then you can say, okay, I'm going to manage all the required infrastructure in, in a GitOps way yeah. using standard GitOps tooling that talks to the Kubernetes API. So yeah, it's it's it, it's, I mean, I've been an API fanatic for, for 20 years. I started a company up that does API management. And, and you know, this is the power of standard APIs, isn't it? It's, it's something yeah. we've been hunting for for 20 years. And, and Kubernetes is one of the examples that's really taken off as a, as a really nice standard API. Yeah, and I mean, all these things can then leverage all that work that's already gone into uh, the the, uh, the the API server, the controller managers, all those, those kind of uh, interesting reconciling behavior that uh, that is often where uh, the hardest work actually happens to make all that work in the background, and it's the bit that no one ever gets to see. 
And also cool things like, you know, K9S and Kubernetes observability projects and Prometheus and Grafana and Cortex and, uh, and, and Flux and Argo and all these projects that work around the Kubernetes API suddenly give you like so much more power. So, you know, just the fact that I was using K9S without any modifications to, map, to, to look at, see what clusters yeah. were running, super nice. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, um, thank you, Paul. Um, if you've got any Thanks, questions, Matt. Paul, Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I think he's probably hanging out in the uh, in the Slack channel there. And uh, Paula, over to you to uh, to intro the next bit. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Paul, for that great talk.